What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Collider Interview Studio at Sundance 2024, brought to you by the fine folks at Filmio. Filmio is all about putting the power to green light films in the hands of fans and creators. And we are lucky to have them behind us, supporting us as we get to cover independent film. If you want to learn more about Filmio, check out their website, film.io. Now I have the pleasure of introducing you all to the team behind 10 Lives. Huge congratulations on your movie. You. I'm a big cat lover. This movie filled my heart. Oh, good, man. That's lovely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, I'm going to throw this first question to you because a lot of our viewers are going to be first learning about 10 Lives via Sundance. So would you do them a favor and give them a brief synopsis of your movie? Can I give a brief synopsis by pointing to back at you? Yeah. Who, uh, well, we meet him at the beginning of the movie. Is um, he? He's a cat that that thinks he's got humans down, all figured out, and through the process of being very selfish, he loses nine lives. Then he meets Rose, and and understands. Oh, there's something better here. I I don't want to be a jerk like I was before. But then her boyfriend comes back into the picture, and all bets are off because doesn't want to live in a rush truck. For the kids, that's three people are living in one um, But, uh, and so he goes about trying to get rid of Larry, the ex-boyfriend, and in doing so, he loses his last, his night life. He goes up to the, the gateway to the other lives that cats have, and is eventually, because of his sincere love for Rose, is offered nine more lives and it that's the best thing ever possibly have happened but he comes back all his different variants and so the story from there is about how a cat uh is learning by being in someone else's shoes and and learning to not be selfish and to appreciate life for what it gives you cat human anything i feel like <laughs> everything on this planet would benefit from learning like that that's a good hope yes <laughs> Two-part question about uh, developing this idea. What was the very first part of the story that you came up with, the thing that started it all? But then I also want to know, did you have a break story moment, a thing that you came up with along the way that made you convinced you had a whole vision for this tale? Well, actually, yeah. I mean, there were many along the way. I mean, when you get to work with such incredible people and uh, we had a wonderful cast in general. And so what I like to do is to create room for the actors to inhabit the character and and not necessarily follow the script um and it's in that process of discovery improvisation that you really start to find out well, what would they do what would how does rose really feel about this how does beckett really feel about this how much of a jerk at the beginning is he and then he, how far can we bring him back to a place where what is this can cheer and cry or mm -hmm. but, and um, and and so that was a complete revelation all the way through. It was it was a beautiful project to work on. the The beginning of it for me was really when I was uh, told that I could send this in England, and so we went to Dorset, which is the English Riviera. Um, and all great animated movies like to take you somewhere else. Lion King takes you to Africa, obviously. Little Mermaid takes you to something. Um, under the sea. Under the sea. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, and it was a it was a, a wonderful opportunity for me because I live in Los Angeles to dive into everything I love about Fulgen and and make it as much of a character as the characters are. So nothing was disingenuous about the movie. Everything was sincere, and that's what I see ultimately. Is. I think you feel it while you're watching it. I also love the idea that you are able to give your actors the opportunity to play because I feel like the general assumption with animation is that the animated work is so difficult to pull off that everything has to be very rigid and strict to what those animators create. Yeah, definitely. So for the two of you now yeah, that, getting into... That wasn't the experience on this. Ooh. We got to play so much. Um, yeah, Chris was so generous and with his direction, with um, sharing his you know his amazing imagination is so infectious um so yeah but that, that was definitely the the vibe for this one lots of playtime this yeah. marks your your first time for both of you voicing uh, an animated character in a feature film i feel like maybe the playing around could answer this question but what would you say is the biggest misconception you had about what it would mean to voice an animated character when you first joined the project 
I think for me, it, it was definitely, I remember my first session in my head, I think sometimes you can watch animated films and you feel like, oh, I need to give it a voice. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. like it has to have an iconic voice. Now, how, how do I sound like a cat? And and I remember before I had any session reading the script and I was like, oh, I'm going to make the, the cat sound like this because you have a visual of how it looks, but you don't realize you're like, this cat has to be me before it can be someone else. So I think it's it's so important what Chris was saying about improvisation because I come from stand-up comedy background. So I'm so used to improvising. And then Chris said, no, be you, be yourself. And then that just lets you, lets your imagination flow of how you can make it sound, how you can make it move and walk and talk and stuff as well. Just because that makes me curious, when you first saw like the first rendering of Beckett, what yeah. did you think he sounded like before you landed on, you know, it being truly you? Well, I think at first, like in my in my head, I was like, Wah, I'm a cat, Wah. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just how I was used to playing a cat because most cats are always crafty. Whether it's like Top Cat or, you know, Tom, they're always the... They're always the the kind of ah you know I'm like Tom is always out to get Jerry. Top Cat is the coolest cat. Whereas I was in a different position where I was I was trying to be loved at the beginning of the film, and then you then then I I become loved, and then you kind of get pushed out. So it's almost you have to put your I, I had to put Beckett's ego aside and be like okay I've got to get back into the good books a little bit. So yeah, it was it was a fun challenge, really fun challenge. All right, Simone, I'll go back to that original question for you now. The biggest misconception you had about what it was going to take to act in an animated feature? It's pretty much the same. Like, I think I, I love voice acting, giving uh, even my own dog a little voice, impersonating like Kermit the Frog or like Lilo, like Stitch from Lilo and Stitch. This is my favorite thing that pet owners do. I know all of my friends' voices for their animals. Totally. It's, we can't help but personify them. I don't know what it is. I'm sure there's some like weird scientific psychological reason why we do it but um yeah it, the exact same like uh, trying to like create almost like a cartoon like out you know out of body kind of voice and then you you know with, with Chris it's so genuine this this whole movie every every essence about it and you feel vulnerable you're so stripped down and it's like cool it's just my voice and then all that you really focus on is the emotion and the connection between you know the friendship with Beckett and Rose and the worlds around them. So yeah, um, I think that was definitely something that made this so special mm. and changed my mind about what it is to to voice act. So many follow-up questions. I don't want to leave the idea of us voicing our pets for a minute though. I'm, I'm assuming, is everyone a pet owner here? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. What is the greatest length you've ever gone to for your pet? Like something you do for your pet that is like above and beyond over the top. I think, uh, I remember once my, my, uh, my dog was ill and she kept having bad diarrhea which and at the time i lived in an apartment and i remember staying up all night just watching the dog being like do you need to go just do you need to go and then taking her down because she was still a puppy at this stage taking her downstairs and it was probably like three in the morning and being like oh yeah. my god i'm so tired right now but yeah. i understand you're very ill and you can't talk to me you can't say i've got a bad stomach so that was the yeah. lengths i went to yeah good pet parent right fun. there yeah um my dog's called Myla and um, she went through a phase when she was a puppy where she just wouldn't eat. She was just so bored of her food. And um, I um, <laughs> I made this thing called, <laughs> called Myla Moosh and I would sing a song to her whilst doing it just to like get her sight for like dinner time. Be like, oh, whoa, oh my God, bit of this, bit of that. Oh, and then I pretend to put it in the oven, like time it, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, it's yeah. ready now. And like take it out with my oven gloves and like, you know, make this whole thing for her. And it's the same, <laughs> it's the same dish, but um, I'd sing the Milo Moosh song and then it worked and she was psyched for her meal. I still yeah. get this, still yeah. get this. How yeah. about for you, Chris? Well, all right, Hold so. <laughs> When my Ruby, who is now six years old, was a puppy, I picked her up from the the yeah uh, the breeders, and I brought her home. And I was so in love with this dog. I mean, it's still am. Don't tell her I said that. Um, and and I picked this little puppy up, golden retriever, right, big face with a slightly you know closed eyes, and I kissed her full on the lips. No tongues, but I would have done. <laughs> and that's how much I loved her. And, uh, and and it's been like that ever since. I mean, in terms of like just things you do with your pets and where you take them and walks and crazy antics. And 
both and I have two gun retrievers now, and together they were the comedians that got us through uh, mm. the lockdowns, really. And it was around here that I was actually, around that time I was being asked to uh, work on 10 Lights. So they were definitely inspiration. Yeah. My folks have two dachshunds and they're like kissy dogs. I'm not going to stop them. Yeah. They can kiss me all they want. <laughs> Above and beyond, I have my my oh. Dewey on my wrist for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> so cute with a hat and everything. He he was named after Deputy Dewey from Scream, so that's his little deputy oh. hat. Oh wow! Yep. Great. So that's that's my above and beyond. I feel like I had a follow up. Oh, I remember what it was. Um, Simone, when you're doing a performance like this, where you're so hyper focused on your voice and your voice alone, did that give you the opportunity to add any tools to your acting toolkit that you now find yourself applying to your live action work? Wow, what a great question. Um, I think, you know, the beauty of animation is it, it, it encourages you to really use your, imag use your imagination. That rhymes. Um, and you're, you, you know, tap into having faith, having hope that this is real, this could happen, like really believing it. Um, believing that you're there in the booth, talking to the cat, talking to the horse, all of these different things. And I think, um, yeah, that's, I think, something I apply to real life and apply to my um, on like live action work as well. Sure. It really is an extreme gift because what they're not telling you is that there's no other actor in the room. So uh, all of the emotion, all of the, uh, the sincerity that's coming out, it's just some both over zoo in California and say, well, that's true, that's true. And what if, and I mean, again, not everybody can do this. These guys are really good at it. And, and the, that life, that, that, that fun in every syllable comes through in the movie. And it goes so you have to talk with some a little bit. Yeah. I, Chris, I, I, I just kept prodding Chris at the beginning of this. Like, I can sing. I'd love to sing in this. I've written some songs, my ukulele. None of my songs, like, it was all Zane. Like, Zane's music, Zane's soundtrack is just beautiful in this. But um, Chris was so generous and said, would you like to sing this song and do a duet with Zane? And yeah, it made my year. It was one of the best experiences ever. That was such a beautiful, sweet thing to add. Now I'm going to make it awkward because I'm fascinated by efforts when you're voice acting. Can you each pinpoint, you know, an effort that came naturally to you? But then I also want the opposite, like an everyday sound that's just really difficult to replicate believably in the sound booth. I think my one of my second sessions was pretending to climb through a drain pipe as as a rat. And it was the most... In your head, you're like, this is easy. You just pretend to climb, but then you're like, hold on, no. <laughs> and it is because it had to break and then I had to squeeze again. And uh, when you do it the first time, you're like, that's probably it. And it's like, if you do it again, but imagine this time you're really stuck. And then and then uh, it's like, okay, cool. And then the eagle's going to take you and you have to imagine. And I was literally, I'm very physical. So I'd be like, huh. Imagine yeah. I've, I've been taken by an eagle and um, it pushes you as a range because I, again, this is very new for me, but trying to, I think when you, you know, when you're able to say the lines and you can be funny and articulate yourself is, is quite easy. But when you have to do all the intricate stuff and, you know, be a horse and you're, you know, you have to imagine that you're smashing up um, someone's kind of laboratory is quite difficult to do and imagine. Mm -hmm. You get to see it, but you're like, okay, cool. How would I sound if I, if I fell, you know? So um, I think that, that breathing, that <laughs> it was, yeah, that was hard. It's <laughs> a good example, fair example <laughs> yeah. right there. <laughs> what do you got for us, Simone? I think, I think Mo had like one of the hardest jobs, I think really bringing a cat to life. So I think for Rose, you know, she, she, she is like our, our young modern day woman heroine in this movie um so i guess some of it it was just actually not making it so difficult and just believing it and like something as natural as like not overthinking it um i think that because i think it's natural to overthink something like that when you're in the booth and like you're cut off from all the other senses and it's just your voice um i think i'd love to do something similar to beckett one day like really do like an animal or something a bit more larger than life like a cartoony kind of animal one day i get my notebook out really quick yeah yeah well <laughs> I, I, mean, do. I feel like uh is that like is there a different department for different animals and it could just become an anthology where yeah like, I believe different so, yeah. animals go go up and come back and do it all over again even humans even humans 
I have to end with our uh, Filmio specific question, because as I mentioned up top, the company is all about putting the creative power in the artist's hand and also the fan's hands as well. So for each of you, whether it was on this project or something else you've done, can you give me an example of a time when someone else gave you the creative power? Maybe a time when, you know, you thought you deserved it, but you didn't expect to get it. Mm. Well, for me, it would be on this film. I, again, I didn't have any perceived notion of how I approach this. And, you know, Chris was just like, be yourself, do you? And he wanted me to be me, like almost as much as me as possible in this film, from having little anecdotes, the way that I speak, the way that I speak naturally and where I'm from and my background. And I was able to put that in the cat. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what I enjoyed so much. It took me out of my comfort zone, but also it was a challenge. There's times where I'd say something and look at Chris and that, like, yeah, he liked it. That's cool. Like, so that, that's probably my, that, my, my one. Yeah. Good example right there. Um, I guess definitely on this project, I think, you know, I think all artists like directors, actors, whatever you're doing in the world of film or music, whatever it is, you, it's understanding you, you have the right to have creative input. Like it's you, it's your work. Like, so uh, I I guess that's what I would say to any young um, aspiring artists listening, watching this, that you, it's your right, like it's your, it's your craft. So yeah, you have creative input. Should always be that simple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about for you, Chris? There was an old fella who was in his nineties when he in Bash at Disney. Joe Grant, and he wrote Dumbo. The most oh, many years of Naples. And this guy was such, he was a gentle man. He's a gentle man. And uh, I got close to him in, in the last couple of years of his life, actually. Uh, he showed me all of the references that he'd collected over the years. So you can do this. And it took me from where I was as an animator into another part of, the, of making movies. And uh, I'll always remember that. It's a great guy. Beautiful guy. Such a beautiful example. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you to all three of you for being here and talking 10 lives with us. Thank you. Thank to you. everybody out there, 10 lives, don't miss it. A must see for animal lovers, obviously, but really anybody who wants to walk out of a movie with a full heart. So check it out. And we'll be back soon with more interviews at Sundance 2024.